I'm actually really thrilled to uh, introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Scott Summers, who is professor and chair of the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology in the department or in the College of Health. Um, Scott also runs um, with Jared Rutter, the Diabetes Metabolism, Metabolism and Research Center, which I should know that name very well right now. And he actually, I want to congratulate him now that I can kind of see him in this version of in person and uh, getting all the materials of a huge Diabetes Research Center grant in yesterday. And I thought the best way to congratulate him for putting together a, probably a thousand page document is to have him give a talk the next day. I can't think of anything kinder to do to somebody. So actually, <laughs> so actually I am really sorry, Scott. And I saw that you were, I'm like, oh God, I feel like such a jerk, but it is what it is. So anyways, I, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm sure it's on my end. I'm sure I inadvertently said, yeah, that day is fine. But yeah, it is a, it's been a little bit of a busy week, but it's good. Well, with that, we'll turn it over to you to learn um, from you today. Thank you so much for doing this, especially today. Yeah, no worries. I'm looking forward to it, actually. I um, So I would like for this to be really interactive. And I hope that um, I'm, I'm going to try and prompt a lot of questions if I don't get a lot of discussion, then it's going to be really, really short. So I've, I've planned this with the idea that we were going to have some time to, to talk about things. Um, I am going to, let me, let me pull up my slides. And, um, and I think I'd never done Zoom before. Okay. Um, everybody sees that? So I am... Um, going to introduce three what is concepts. If I understand the gist of this whole exercise, I'm supposed to introduce three sort of terms or a handful of terms that you may not be familiar with, or may maybe you are, and, um, and how this relates to um, our research and to human health. And so I'm going to try and give you an alternative view of how diabetes and metabolic disease happens. And it centered, centers on these three terms. And the first one is selective insulin resistance. So the key is the word selective in that. The second is the concept lipotoxicity. And the third is ceramide. So let me just ask, has anybody heard of any of those terms? Angie has, congratulations. You can have a chocolate. Um, again. I want to get everybody out here so I can see everybody's faces. Okay, um, so selective insulin resistance is where we're going to start. Um, so let's start by working through each one of these different words, okay? And we'll start with insulin. What is insulin? And hopefully you have a pretty good sense of what insulin is. So um, insulin is a hormone. It's secreted from pancreatic islets. These are pictured here in the green. These pancreatic islets represent about 1% of the pancreas. So they are, um, they are these little islands in the, in the pancreas that are linked to the blood system. And the other 99% of the pancreas is the exocrine pancreas, which secretes all the digestive enzymes into the gut. So in that islet, there's another hormone, a hormone called glucagon. Have you all heard of glucagon? Yeah, okay. So glucagon is a hormone that does the opposite of insulin. It's anti-insulin. It is, goes up um, when you uh, haven't had chocolate um, and it is responsible for liberating your energy stores. Um, whereas insulin is released after you've eaten and it's responsible for, um, for, um, for taking all the food you just ate and, and turning it into some storageable storage form of energy that you can use later. And so this is sort of, we live in one of these two states. Well, most people, let me erase, most people live in one of these two states. They live in either the fed state or the anabolic state or the fasted state, the catabolic state. I say most people because I haven't been in a catabolic state in about 30 years, but most people live, you know, cycle between these states of being either fed or not. And when you're in the fed state, so you've just eaten, you have an increase in the release of this hormone insulin, and you have a decrease in the release of this hormone glucagon. 
And the net effect is that you take all the food that you're eating and you try and store it because the body wants to store it for some later time when energy needs may be or when the energy sources aren't ab abundant. You're not next to a 7-Eleven or something. You wanna have something to rely on when you don't have food at your disposal. And so you store it. You store it as either glycogen or you can store it as protein or most of the energy we store as triglyceride. And the vast majority of the extra energy we have in the body is stored as fat in the form of triglyceride. And that's why I don't look good in a bathing suit. The alternative state is to be in the, the fasted state, the catabolic state, and that's the opposite. So you have a decrease in this hormone insulin, you have an increase in glucagon, and you release all of your energy stores. And the big point of glucagon is your brain needs glucose. It lives on glucose. And so you, you wanna make sure you have enough glucose in the bloodstream. So it actually causes glucose to go out of the bloodstream for the brain, whereas insulin causes glucose to go um, out of the bloodstream and, and into the peripheral tissues. So I hope I said that right. So that's what these two hormones do, okay? And so if we're gonna talk about insulin resistance, let's think about insulin in a fairly simplistic way. This is what I think of that, you know, most people think of insulin doing in the body. It stimulates the removal of glucose from the bloodstream. It brings it into muscle to make more proteins to build your muscles. It takes it into the fat cells to make a lot more fat to store the energy for later. And it represses glucose efflux from the liver. So it suppresses the liver and prevents it from um, secreting glucose. And in this particular instance, glucagon does the opposite. It actually promotes glucose release, whereas insulin inhibits it. So that's what insulin does. Um, it's released from these, um, these pancreatic islets when glucose levels reach a critical threshold. And so let me ask, and I hope somebody answers, what would be your definition of insulin resistance? Uh, isn't it when the body is releasing ins insulin, but um, it doesn't seem to be functioning properly? Exactly, I think that's right. So most people would say it's it's the inability to, of insulin to work effectively. And looking at this pretty simple schematic, you can say, okay, well, that means that insulin is not able to you know, bring glucose into fat, glucose into muscle and block glucose delivery from the liver. So we're comfortable with that as a definition of insulin resistance. How would you as a clinician measure insulin resistance? So insulin resistance is a, an important concept because if you have insulin resistance, you're at risk for diabetes and heart disease, right? So hopefully you're aware, I see some heads nodding, so you should, hopefully you're aware of this. So this is a major risk factor for the major diseases and major causes of death in our body. So if you're a clinician and you want to tell your patient, hey, you have insulin resistance, how do you do it? You can look at blood sugar. And your okay, blood sugar. Um, what would be your measure of insulin resistance? So high blood sugar. Okay, so insulin, so blood sugar could be high. That could be a good sign of insulin resistance. If you don't secrete insulin, if you don't make insulin, um, is your blood sugar also high? Yeah. Yes. So that means the high glucose could actually mean that you're insulin resistant or that you don't make insulin. So it's not a perfect measure of insulin resistance. So is there something we could do that's better? I seem to remember something about like a C-peptide um, testing or I don't know if that's. C-peptide is interesting. So when insulin is released from the pancreas, it, it, it actually, there's a longer form of it and this C-peptide gets cut off. And so you can actually measure the amount of insulin that's released by measuring that C-peptide. So that's one thing you could do. You could actually measure the amount of glucose and you could measure the amount of insulin and that would give you a sense of whether or not you have insulin resistance or not. That's a good, that's a good idea. Any other thoughts? The reason you might be struggling with this, this is actually a tougher concept than um, one might think because we use this term insulin resistance all the time. 
and we tell patients they have insulin resistance, but we don't actually ever, or we rarely measure insulin resistance in the clinics. We normally measure glucose. And I think we kind of judge whether they're insulin resistant or insulin sensitive by whether they're fat or not. Um, but that's not a terribly good thing either because we know that really obese people can be very insulin sensitive and very lean people can be very insulin resistant. So it's actually a really challenging question to ask this. So can you, I, I'm just totally guessing here, but can, I mean, can you kind of measure it twice and do some challenge in the middle and look at differences? You can, and I actually have on the next, um, oh, two, a few slides down. Um, these are some of the measures of insulin resistance. There are, uh, and, and they, they change, and there are two slides of this, so you'll see there are a lot, and I'm not gonna go through any of the specific ones, but the, um, Generally, they all involve some amount of um, relate, looking at the relationship between the amount of insulin in the blood and the amount of glucose. And then some people throw in some other things like fat or things that I'll, I'll tell you why they look at that. The one gold standard is exactly what you were referencing. And it's called something called the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, where you actually infuse high levels of insulin. And then you look at the amount of glucose you have to give in order to to keep glucose at a normal level. And that reflects how much glucose is going into the tissues. So if you have to pump in a lot of glucose under these hyperinsulinemic conditions, that means you're really insulin sensitive. And if you don't have to pump, pump in a lot of glucose, that means your glucose isn't being taken out of the blood very well. That technique though, involves putting in some catheters, um, you know, doing some interventions to people. So it's not something that we actually do clinically very much. It's more of a research instrument of measuring insulin resistance. So instead of that, we do a lot of these other things. The most common thing is this HOMA IR, which is just a ratio of insulin to glucose. And it's a pretty imperfect measure um, for the reasons that I'm mentioning. Okay, so I've mentioned the problems with insulin resistance is sort of a concept just in terms of clinic as a clinical instrument because it's hey, really yeah. not something to measure. Yeah. Mickey has a follow-up question. Sorry, but before oh, we sure. start explaining no. more I complicated things. Yeah, I said no, great. Well, I apologize for being late. I'm I'm a single parent for the weekend. My husband's gone on a fun road trip. So I, I had to do the school run. So I apologize for being late. So I love this conversation about just measurement. So often in so many fields nobody thinks about making sure we do a good job at measuring what is important and then we use all of these suboptimal things so i love just the fact that you're bringing this up and my question was one of if there's a really complicated measure which is hard to do because you have to like stick catheters in everybody has anyone kind of look, done modeling between that which might be a quote unquote gold standard and then lots of other things to try and model how you do what's acceptable and easy towards what you want? Yeah, they have. And actually this, um, this last column on this slide deck that I've prepared actually lists the relationship between each of these measures, the HOMA IR, the quickie, that's my favorite, the quickie, um, measure of insulin resistance, which are these sort of static one-time blood tests. And it looks at the relationship between those and the euglycemic clamp. Um, and there are, you know, here the relationship is 0.73, here it's 0.56. They're not perfect. Um, they have a lot of room for error. Um, to be honest, the euglycemic clamp also has problems because you're measuring it in pretty artificial conditions. And one thing that happens is people get really stressed when you put catheters in them and, and being stressed affects your, the way that you handle glucose. So um, it's in some ways more of a measure of how stressed you get when you put in catheters versus how well your insulin is working. Um, it, it's a real problem. And, and it's actually something that when I go to the clinic, I ask people to measure my insulin because um, I would like to know it's not something that is standard of care, or at least it never used to be. Um, okay, so I think with that definition, though, that the idea that insulin resistance is the inability to clear glucose in response to an effective or a dose of insulin, um, people have for years thought of the progression of diabetes and metabolic disease as being this, meaning that most glucose is taken up in skeletal muscle. 
And so one of the first things that happened is either because you, you get fat or you get old or you have some genetic predisposition, um, you this muscle doesn't respond to insulin very well, glucose levels start to go up, and then you eventually develop something called impaired glucose tolerance. And that's where even though you're injecting insulin, you, you maybe have to give a little more insulin and it finally clears. And then it gets to the point that even though you're injecting a lot of insulin, it still is, is staying higher than it should. And it's sort of a threshold between insulin resistance where you generally stay euglycemic and impaired glucose tolerance where after a meal, your glucose stays high for a little period of time. And then you progress to diabetes where your glucose is just high most of the time. And then you also get insulin resistance in these other tissues. So in fat tissue, insulin doesn't work as well. So you don't store glucose as well and you get lipolysis. So the fatty acids start to come into the blood and the liver doesn't respond to insulin very well. So you secrete more glucose. So that contributes to this impaired glucose tolerance. And you respond to that by producing a lot more insulin because the glucose is high in the blood. So you say, I'm gonna make a lot more. And that works for a little while. And that's sort of the pre-diabetic condition that I'm showing you right here, where you have insulin resistance or paired glucose tolerance, but your body is cranking out a lot more insulin. And then at some point, your, your beta cells say, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't keep producing insulin. And you develop impaired glucose tolerance that then will develop into frank diabetes. So I think that's generally what we think of in terms of insulin resistance. Um, does that all make sense to you as a disease progression and a definition of insulin resistance? And I'm, I'm looking at you on my other screen, so it's, I'm not looking away from you. I'm, I'm actually looking at you when I look away. Okay, now I'm going to throw a wrinkle into this because there's a problem with this. If you start to think about what is the pathology or what is the etiology of disease, and that is um, insulin does a whole bunch of stuff. It doesn't just promote glucose. Um, you know, removal from the bloodstream. It actually affects just about every organ system. It affects how much you eat. It affects how well your blood vessels dilate. It affects the heart. It affects the immune system. Um, one of the good examples is in the liver. And so in the liver, insulin will, you know, inhibit glucose output so that's denoted by this down arrow, and it does it through this little pathway here. But it also stimulates the conversion of glucose into fat and the delivery of fat and lipoprotein. So you probably have heard of LDL cholesterol and things like that, or serum triglycerides. Insulin is one of the major drivers of this because it packages all of that extra food you're eating into those LDL particles that then are secreted in the bloodstream to be delivered to all the tissues. So if you think about somebody with a metabolic syndrome, do they have high or low fat in the bloodstream? Because if they're resistant to insulin, yeah, I see a thumbs up, right? So they're, they're, their lipid levels are actually quite high in the blood. But if they're insulin resistant, they shouldn't be making these LDL particles. They shouldn't be making fat in the liver. So, it doesn't quite make sense in the terms of insulin resistance because this insulin resistance is really only with regards to glucose. It's selective, meaning at least in the context of the liver, you see this effect happening on this arm of insulin's actions, but not on these effects on lipid metabolism. So their ability to turn glucose and other things into fat is actually enhanced in somebody who's got insulin resistance. This was this phrase, selective insulin resistance was, was coined by Roger, um, uh, by Mike Brown and Roger, um, Roger Unger, um, Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein, who got the Nobel Prize for discovery of cholesterol mechanisms. And it was, they, they coined this in a preview article where they just, where they were evaluating somebody's work who had actually gotten rid of insulin signaling in the liver and they found out if you got rid of all insulin in the liver, it didn't look anything like insulin resistance. And this is an example of, of that. So in normal liver metabolism, insulin will decrease glucose and increase triglycerides. So you get less glucose in the bloodstream and you get more triglyceride in the bloodstream. But in the context of 
somebody who's on their way to type two diabetes or has prediabetes, you actually see this arm being impaired. So glucose levels stay high, but this arm actually stays high and it, it actually goes higher because now you have more insulins floating around in the bloodstream because you have more glucose in the bloodstream. So you actually get this upregulation in this arm compared to the normal condition. This is what I mean by selective insulin resistance. Insulin's effects on glucose are affected, but its effects on fat are not. Okay, uh, that was all developed because somebody had knocked out all of insulin and they found out, yep, yeah, sure enough, insulin affects fat in the liver. And if you get rid of all insulin signaling, you get something different. This was called a lurkomice, uh, a liver insulin receptor knockout mile. So they took out the molecule that responds to insulin in the liver and they were able to make everything better. Um, whereas with insulin resistance, you don't make things better, you make things worse. Okay, so that's concept one. So is everybody comfortable with, with selective insulin resistance? Thumbs up? Okay, good. Um, if I'm going too slowly for you or too fast for you, give me some sort of sign if you would, because I'm, I'm, it's a little harder to gauge uh, from Zoom faces where my, whether I'm pitching things at the right level or not. Okay, so the next concept I want to introduce is lipotoxicity. So this is a, uh, a phrase that was coined by, um, by uh, the late Roger Unger, who, who just died. Um, and his colleague, Dennis McGarry, wrote this article, um, What If Minkowski Had Been a Guzik? And it's, one, it's my favorite article in science. And I, it was written in 1992 um, by, by Dennis who um, also unfortunately passed away a number of years ago. Dennis won the Banting Medal for Outstanding Research on Diabetes. And just to give you a background, so I, I should, I guess I should have added, what is it, a Guzik? It's, that's, I don't, a lot of people, including me, had to look that up. Um, a Guzik is when you don't have a sense of taste, okay? And the story behind this, and maybe you've heard this before, is in the late 1800s, there was an individual who was, surgically trying to figure out what the pancreas did. And he took the pancreas out of a dog surgically. His name was Minkowski. He took the surgery out, the pancreas out of a dog. The dog lived. He came back to his lab the next day. He noticed the dog had been urinating all over the cage and that there were all kinds of flies congregating around the urine. And he was curious about that. Why were these dogs peeing so much? And why were these flies so attracted to the urine? So he tasted it. So this was the initial blood glucose test. Uh, before, now we have the little monitor things, but in the past, it used to be this. I actually made my grad students do this just out of his, for history. So I'm kidding, that's a joke, Andrew. <laughs> Is this being recorded? Um, so, but I can totally see you doing that, Scott. That's, I think that's what the most disturbing thing is. <laughs> it turns out people have been describing that diabetes, diabetics had sweetened urine for about 2,000 years. So it's, I always tell my students, make sure and read the literature because you could have maybe avoided that, that mistake you would have known before. Anyway, they... Because of that, because of that experience where he tasted the urine, found it was sweet, diabetes evolved as a disorder associated with impaired sugar metabolism, right? And, you know, we now have, and, and the other thing is shortly thereafter, they developed a good strategy to measure glucose in the blood. So diabetes became a sugar disease. Sugar diabetes is what my, um, my grandmother used to call, call it. Um, what Dennis asked was, what if Minkowski had had no sense of taste, right? How would he have interpreted this entire thing? And he said, well, what he might have done is he might have come to the urine and he could have looked at it and tried to figure out why the flies were attracted and he couldn't taste it. So maybe he would have smelled it or something like that. And he would have noticed that not only is glucose high, but if you smell it, you notice there's this sense of acetone because there's a complete change in the way we, we metabolize other nutrients. 
their, their metabolites. Um, the way we handle fat is different and that gets converted in these, these ketone bodies that smell like acetone that give you this different taste. And instead of being sugar diabetes, it would have been fat diabetes because we would have realized this was a disease associated with change with altered fat metabolism. And he actually proposed a completely alternative view of the pathology of diabetes where the initial step was not insulin resistance, but it was actually too much insulin. And it was too much insulin making that fat, making the extra fat that then went out in the bloodstream. And then he said, well, that fat, that extra fat that goes into adipose tissue or the muscle. So you get too much insulin, goes to the liver, it gets, um, it makes all this fat get incorporated in LDLs. It gets delivered to adipose tissue and muscle, and then the muscle maybe develops insulin resistance, which then contributes to this hyperinsulinemia. But he argued that maybe the first step is too much insulin, not, not insulin that doesn't work too well, um, but this is the insult. And that if we re-envision diabetes around the changes in fat metabolism, maybe we would have a better sense of the disease. So that's the premise. Um, the reality is probably both of those things happen. So what is lipotoxicity? How would you re-envision this, this role of fat? So let me just ask you this question. I think we know that being obese, having too much fat is generally a bad thing. It doesn't affect my behavior at all, but it does. It, you know, it's not my lack of awareness that, that it's bad. But why is it bad? If obesity, I mean, besides the fact that you can't get a date, why does being obese influence your ability, your likelihood of getting diabetes and heart disease? What is the connection between those two, those two events? I mean, I, I think I've just always heard it increases uh, your chance of having insulin resistance, but I don't really know any details, I guess. Okay, that's a good, that's actually a good answer. Um, why would having too much fat? So, so where do we keep the fat? Most of the fat we store that makes me look so bad in the bathing suit is actually stored in fat cells. We make these fat droplets, these lipid, these triglycerides, they're mainly triglycerides. They get stored in these little droplets. They get stored in fat cells. Um, that's what the body's meant to do is store a lot of fat in the fat cells so we can use it later. Um, why would that be bad? We don't need to use it later anymore. <laughs> okay, well, why would that still cause insulin resistance or why would that cause me to have an increased risk of heart disease? I understand why it might make me slower and it might make me get more likely to be eaten by a lion because I can't run as fast, but why would this increase my chance of getting heart disease? Nothing to do with plaques in your arteries and, and heart attacks and- No, it sure it could, yeah. So, so one thing is that you can have, you, you have fat, it doesn't get stored inside the fat cell, but it starts to go to the wrong place. And so one of the, one of the clear indications of that are plaques in the arteries. Now, I guess one of my questions there is, why do plaques in the arteries increase your risk of diabetes? The concept behind this that I'm wanting to convey is that it really is the fat that doesn't get, a key. having fat in your belly in, in your um, adipocytes is probably not a bad thing. It's probably exactly what we're supposed to do. And you could be incredibly healthy if all of your fat was stored there, but it's not. And what happens when you're obese is you're more likely to have fat that isn't stored inside those fat cells and starts to go to other places like the heart like the pancreas, like the muscle. And those tissues aren't designed to store it. They're designed to burn fuels for energy. And if they get too much fat, they don't know what to do with it. So um, one of the things we now know is that there are some people that have lipodystrophy. They can't store fat. They have genetic impairments that prevent them 
from effectively making triglyceride droplets and storing the extra energy that they get. And these people get diabetes and heart disease. They get the same sequela of conditions that you see in obesity, these people that have lipodystrophy. And it's because the fat doesn't have a place to go. In this case, because all the fat cells probably just get full because we ate too much. In this case, because the fat cells don't work very well. And the result of that is the fat starts to accumulate in these places that it doesn't belong like the liver or like blood vessels or the heart. And so the best evidence of that is these plaques that are in arteries, but that can't explain everything. That can't explain all of the disease. Plaques in arteries can't explain diabetes, for example. So well, this idea of fat going to the wrong place is lipotoxicity. Okay, question? I was going to say, obviously, if, if you're going to make your arteries smaller, you're going to increase your blood pressure. Sure. And blood pressure itself is a risk factor for diabetes and for other disorders, but it are, are for um, heart disease and other disorders. But it doesn't explain things like um, diabetes, as an example. It doesn't explain how you develop diabetes by not being able to secrete insulin. Um, but that's what happens when people have Okay, so this is the idea of lipotoxicity. And one of the ways we can, we can test this experimentally, one way you can do it is they've, um, over the year, over the last 20 years, there've been several different mouse models where you can, you can genetically get rid of all the fat, which sounds great, right? You can actually genetically engineer this mouse. So you will kill off all the fat cells. You can make all the fat cells. This one is developed by a friend of mine, Philip Bashir, who, who developed a mouse where every fat cell will commit suicide when you add a drug. And it induces apoptosis and these cells all die. And so you get this really fat mouse that becomes really, really skinny right after that. And that sounds great, right? The problem is that mouse gets diabetes. Right. This is an evidence of this is this is impaired glucose tolerance in the early stages where if you get rid of all the fat cells, you give a dose of glucose. Glucose goes up and then it comes down normally. But if you get rid of all the fat, all of a sudden the glucose isn't handled very well. It goes a lot higher. It develops this insulin resistance. It develops um, impaired glucose tolerance. And that's because of a consequence of not being able to effectively store fat in an adipocyte. Um, see, I'm gonna, um, so one of the things that happens in obesity is actually your fat cells don't work as well. They become inflamed. They start to show a pathology and this slide is very complicated but it's supposed to depict that. But one of the ideas about diabetes is that the first thing that happens is that there's a defect in your fat tissue. And if we could continue to make um, these fat cells healthier and allow them to just take on all the extra fat, you would stay healthy. This guy, Philip Shear, who generated this mouse, incredibly creative person, he made another mouse where the fat cells just keep multiplying. And he made the fattest mouse in the world. And this mouse was incredibly capable of taking everything it ate and storing it in fat cells. And I wish I had a picture of it. This ginormous mouse, you know, which looked like a cat, um, was completely metabolically healthy, right? It didn't get diabetes or heart disease. It, it couldn't move, so it would die of bed sores and things, but it, it didn't get any diabetes or heart disease, but was incredibly fat because all the fat was stored exactly where it was supposed to be. So the defect that happens in these folks is probably that their adipose tissue doesn't work very well, either because they just filled it up too much or because they have some other kind of defect that affects it. And as a result, this fat spills out to places it shouldn't be, and those tissues aren't able to handle it very well. Um, there's some other evidence of that. This is a human study where they looked at different people that had different body mass index. So uh, number one is somebody who's very, very skinny. This person has a body mass index of 18. So it's, they're very slender. 
Number two is somebody who's heavy. And this is on this axis is a measure of insulin sensitivity. And uh, on this measure is amount of the fat that they have inside, um, inside their, um, their muscle. So in the wrong place. So they measure the amount of fat that was not in adipose tissue, but was stored somewhere else. And as fat starts to accumulate in the wrong place, people become less insulin sensitive. And that happens even if they're very slender. So people that are very skinny here in the, the white circle, or I'm um, sorry, number two, number two is the one that had the body mass index of 18. Um, this person is very skinny but has insulin resistance and a lot of the fat is stored in the wrong place. Um, this is actually a, a study done by Roger when he first, Roger Unger, when he first developed the term lipotoxicity. This is looking at an animal model that progresses through the phases of prediabetes where you produce too much insulin, um, but you're still able to meet your needs. And then at some point, the you produce less insulin and you become a full-on diabetic, even though you're, you're, you're getting more insulin resistant and you're producing less insulin, so you develop diabetes. This is looking at the islets down at the bottom. These are the cells that produce the insulin. You see they grow, you get a big increase in those islets in the pre-diabetic state, and then they start to fail. And what you see is as the animal progresses from pre-diabetes to diabetes, the amount of fat that's stored in these tissues actually goes up quite a bit. So we think one of the reasons these islets fail is because this fat starts to accumulate in the islet where it doesn't belong. And that islet is not prepared to deal with that much fat. That's lipotoxicity. That's the damage that happens from having fat in the wrong place. Let's see what else I have. This is a summary of sort of, I think, what this was written by Roger and, uh, and Philip Shear, the two people I, I referenced earlier. Um, this is sort of how we envision the, di the lipotoxicity or lipotoxic disease happening. You know, we don't move enough. We become, we start to overproduce insulin for, for whatever reason, you know, or maybe because we just eat too much. So the glucose levels are high in the blood all the time. And then you start to produce a lot more fat um, in the form of LDLs. So this glucose gets converted to fat and you have LDLs and these contribute to cholesterol deposition in plaques and that's its own thing. But then there's a, this other arm that does damage to other tissues and it produces other fats that are, that are harmful to these other tissues. So that's the concept of lipotoxicity, basically just fat being in the wrong place. Does that make sense? Okay, last thing I wanna tell you about is um, what is ceramide? And what the bottom line is, I think ceramide are the most damaging lipid species that develop, that form in lipotoxicity, okay? So I think these are the types of, it's kind of like cholesterol. It's a kind, a kind of fat that I think is really, really bad for uh, the body in the long term. So this will be my most sort of molecular aspect of this. So um, the cell is surrounded by these membranes, right? These membranes are largely made of fat molecules and, and, um, and these surround every single cell in your body. And if you have too much fat, free fatty acids, they actually will dissolve these membranes. And that's something that we don't want to happen so that the body does a lot of things to make sure that we don't have a lot of these free fatty acids around, okay? And even in the bilayer, you see here, it's got this little schematic depicting a, um, a fat molecule, has two different fat molecules on it, not just one. That's what these two chains are supposed to represent. That's called a phospholipid. These will form these stable bilayers, but the free fatty acids are actually quite bad for the cell. They'll totally disrupted. So we don't have very many free fatty acids around. We try and keep them really low. And we do that by conjugating them to bigger lipid molecules. And when you have fat come into the body, you can either, you, you conjugate it to things. One thing you conjugate it to is this big 
protein called coenzyme A. And so that traps it in the body, but then that's not a very efficient way to store it. So we try and couple that fatty acid to different backbones. We couple it either to a molecule called carnitine or one called glycerol or one called uh, iron amino acid. And the products of these are, the acyl carnitines are how we burn fat. So these, these derivatives of fat get taken into mitochondria and are used for energy. So that would be a good thing to do, right? Is to try and burn all your fat as energy and rely on that. So that's a good thing. And if that doesn't work, then we start to couple them to this glycerol moiety. This is a product of glucose metabolism. And this is how we make all the triglycerides. And so this is where all the extra fat goes. So we can either burn it for energy through this carnitine pathway, or we can couple it to glycerol and put it in this, this, um, this pathway that makes all these triglycerides. And then the last place we can put it is into this pathway that makes sphingolipids. And this is a very minor pathway in comparison. It's, um, it's when you conjugate this, instead of conjugating it to a glucose derivative or to carnitine, you couple it to products of protein metabolism. And the question has always been, why do we have these? What's the point? They're not very abundant. This is actually a picture of, um, this is a, just a, a tissue. Um, it's actually the gut, but you could take it randomly. In dark blue, these are all the glycerolipids that are made. These in light blue are the sphingolipids, and this is the ceramides. Um, and, you know, they're not very abundant, but why do we have them at all? What's the point of that? And my group has been putting out this argument, which I think some people are starting to believe besides me, that they are signals to the body that this pathway is full, this pathway is full. We need to figure out how to accommodate this extra energy that's coming in. And these molecules, ceramides, we think are the, the key signaling entity. So I think about the best way. So there's some data that these ceramides might be bad, right? And one of the things is if you measure them in a person, then they actually relate to disease. So this is people here in Utah that underwent bariatric surgery. So we have a cohort of people that underwent um, bariatric surgery and then were followed for 12 years and then take, took samples again. And we can look at ceramides in the blood, just like we do cholesterol or just like we do anything else, just like we do glucose. And you see that they plummet in individuals that had had surgery here in green, but people that did not have surgery because they were denied insurance or these people that are just controls, their ceramides stayed high. And these people had resolution of disease. And this is another type of ceramide and the same thing happens. And these people did not. So one thing is just looking at correlations between ceramides and disease. And in humans, they correlate just like cholesterol. As a matter of fact, they predict certain diseases better than LDL cholesterol. And they predict so well, this is showing coronary artery disease and diabetes. They actually predict disease so well that clinics have started to measure them. And I first learned this when a woman called me and said, my ceramides are high, what do I do? And I was sitting in this chair and we had a very unpleasant conversation because I had absolutely no answer for her about what she could do to treat her high ceramides. But these are now being measured in the clinic with very little clinical advice about what this means, other than your ceramides are high, you're likely to have to get diabetes or heart attack very, very soon. And um, I, you know, so I think the advice is, you know, exercise and, and eat less. So let me ask you a question. <clears throat> I don't want to get too much in the weeds on sort of the molecular biology, but if you were a cell and you were suddenly, you know, you're living along, you, you have some mix of fat molecules coming in, some mix of, of sugar molecules coming in for energy. Um, 
and all of a sudden your fatty acid levels seem to be getting high and you're worried about protecting your membranes, what would you do? What would be your preferred action to that extra fat? How would you try and prepare yourself for that? I can only think of just trying to get rid of it somehow, send it away somewhere else. But I imagine a cell, I don't know how well a cell can really do that, like traffic it somewhere else besides just getting rid of it, but. Well, yeah, and it comes in anyway, right? Cause it can just float across the membrane, right? So, right. but it's a good, but you're absolutely right. So you want to get rid of it. So how do you get rid of it? Store it, is that what you're talking about? Store it's an idea. Okay, so you could store it. Where would you store it? Somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you'd store it in triglycerides, right? You'd want to store it in those lipid droplets. So one thing that ceramides do is they tell the cell to start making triglyceride droplets. Okay, so they start to tell they tell the liver, okay, you need to make a lot more of your um, you know, take, take, you need to be a lot better about storing this extra fat that you have as triglyceride. So that's one thing, but I, I want to get back to Cecile's question thing about how do you get rid of it? What do we do? How do we get rid of fat molecules in the body? You break if them one down. were to diet, I don't know anything about this, but if one were to diet and exercise, how would you get rid of it? You would jumpstart like your keto, like you would start breaking down fat right to re produce energy that way that might so right so you might start to burn it right you might just start to burn it what's the what's what's the problem with just burning all your fat you it's release energy you'd have a lot of energy and what insulin. are you doing somebody else had something Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying if you have a lot of energy, then you have a lot of insulin, I guess. Yeah, well, what we do with the energy currency we have is ATP, right? We make a lot of ATP. If you heard of it, you've heard of ATP, right? So we, um, so is it better to have a lot of ATP around or a lot of fat molecules around? I don't, actually don't know the answer to that. So, but my theory is that if you don't use ATP, making ATP doesn't make you, you expend more energy, right? you have to get rid of those carbons somehow. You have to get rid of those molecules somehow. And so um, what we think happens, I think you're totally onto this. What we think happens is that the body starts to burn fatty acids more, but it burns them as inefficiently as possible. So it starts to burn them without making ATP. And I don't wanna get into the weeds on this, but I think what happens is one of the ways that you can burn through macronutrients more effectively is by wasting electrons that get overproduced. And the way you waste them is by making a reactive oxygen species. Have you heard of reactive oxygen species? So I think this is a way of the body reacting to too much fat is because it changes its properties in a way that starts to burn the fat really inefficiently. Okay, so we've mentioned two things. So you have sort of this, this happens in mitochondria. So you have really lousy mitochondria that sort of burn, burn through fat really inefficiently and make reactive oxygen species. You have a second thing that's happening where you start to make a lot more triglyceride droplets by storing the fat better. These are both things that are driven by ceramide. There's one other thing you would want to do. If you were a cell and you had, were faced, you've been living on glucose all your life, and all of a sudden you have this big amount of fat coming in and you're worried about this fat being toxic. What else do you wanna do in terms of your fuel choice? What do you wanna to do to the glucose? So just stop using the glucose and start using the fat more? That's right. So, that's another thing we have found that ceramides do is they tell the body to quit using glucose. So you now have three things, and that's what this slide is supposed to represent. We have three things that happen when ceramides start to accumulate in cells. They 
tell the cell to quit using glucose, to store fat, and to burn fat really inefficiently. And this is, to me, prediabetes. This is the metabolic syndrome, right? It's you have too much fat storage, you have um, you don't burn glucose, and you make a lot of reactive oxygen species. That exactly is selective insulin resistance in the liver. And that's what we find that these ceramide molecules do, is they induce this selective insulin resistance. Does that make sense? I started to get more in the weeds than I probably should have in terms of how this all happened. Now, ceramides first became known not for their ability to do these metabolic things, but they became known because what they do is they tell cells to kill themselves. And when they get high enough, they will tell the cell, you need to undergo apoptosis and you need to, um, you know, take this cell out. And I think this is an Sorry. extension of the same thing. Sorry. What is, so you say that it tells a cell to commit, you know, suicide or whatever, uh, apoptosis. Is it, what kind of cells are we talking about here? Are we talking about fat cells? Pretty much yeah. any cell. Um, it turns out fat cells don't accumulate ceramides terribly well. So they're, and probably because they're so much better at storing fat, but it does this in cells like cardiomyocytes. It does this in the kidney. It does this, I was first discovered in, um, in the pancreatic beta cells that secrete insulin. So, um, and I don't know how much you know about apoptosis. This is a way of controlling death. So when a cell dies, one thing it can do is it can burst open, right? If, you know, if the membrane were getting compromised, it would burst open and all the stuff from the inside of the cell would rush out and then the body would have to deal with all this stuff. But by doing apoptosis, it controls the death. It invaginates itself, it eats itself, it does it in a way to control the death. And I think this is an extension of this same response. I think first, when ceramides get high, the cell says, okay, our fatty acid levels are getting out of whack. We need to change our metabolic program. We need to quit using glucose. We need to burn the fat. We need to store the fat. And then when they continue to get higher, they say, all right, this cell is, is dead to me. Let's get rid of this cell. And if all of a sudden you start killing off your cells in the heart and the kidney and the beta cells, what happens? You get diabetes, you get diabetic kidney disease, you get cardiomyopathy. So. I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, is this increased ceramide, is it like a systemic issue where it's like all over the place it's increased or is it just like localized to certain areas? Yeah, that's a great question. Our lab has taken a very brain dead approach to this where we have tried to make ceramides go up or down in every tissue. And um, that's actually one of my slides here is we, we've made them go up or down through these knockout mouse or transgenic mouse in every place. And every place we, we do it, it, it makes the mouse sick. Um, but some places are worse than the others. Um, liver is bad, um, adipose tissue is bad, brown adipose tissue is bad, um, beta cells are bad, the vasculature is bad, the gut's a very different story, the kidney we're doing now. The only place where we haven't found a difference is in the immune system. The immune system seems to, in our hands, doesn't do very much. So question, and there's Nikki here again. So going right back to the beginning when you were saying, how do we measure it? I mean, is this now the thing we should be measuring? And then back to Travis's question, if you if this is going to be great, where would you measure it in somebody coming in to try and? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I think cholesterol actually does its damage in the blood, right? When you think about what cholesterol does to cause disease, it's because it's a big part of plaques. It turns out ceramides are too. They're actually in those same atherosclerotic lesions. But one of the differences, ceramides cause cells to kill themselves. Ceramides cause insulin resistance. Cholesterol doesn't do any of those things. If you take statins to lower your cholesterol, your diabetes risk actually goes up, not down. Um, a number of people who get on statins actually develop diabetes. So um, ceramides probably do most of their damage, not in the blood, but in the tissue. <laughs> So where you measure it is probably a good thing. You probably, where you wanna measure it is in the liver, but that's hard to do. So we don't measure it in everybody's liver, we measure it in their blood. But it's a great question. 
So I'll leave you with just one thing because I know I'm hitting the end of time. Um, what we have found is, you know, if we take a mouse and we either develop drugs that block the production of ceramides, or if we genetically engineer it so it can't make ceramides, we prevent all of these diseases from happening. So we can make a mouse as fat as it wants and it never gets insulin resistance or fatty liver disease, our beta cell failure and diabetes, our kidney disease, our coronary heart disease, none of those things happen if we block ceramides from accumulating. So the bottom line is I think my version of metabolic disease involves these three components. You start, um, you start with, uh, oh, that slide didn't work. Um, you start with, you're eating too much. It doesn't have a place to go either because you just eat too much or because your body's not very well suited to accumulate all this extra calories. So, um, so you change your metabolic program and you change your metabolic program because the fat spills over into places where it doesn't belong and that's lipotoxicity. So the first thing that happens is your body senses that it's got too much fat. It changes its metabolic program to, to not burn glucose, but store fat. That's selective insulin resistance. And then the fat starts to spill out into tissues and do damage. Um, and, and that damage ultimately ends to the death of cells and that's called lipotoxicity. And the key driver of these two events, both of these events we think are these molecules, ceramides, which are what accumulate when you can't store fat, you can't burn it. And those are my three words for the day. I have a really quick question about uh -huh. the pathology of this and sort of at the root of it is how reversible is this? And is it maybe just to a point? Because I imagine when you mentioned say, oh, exercise is one of those, it kind of helps manage disease. Um, I imagine that when you try to burn fat via exercise, but a lot of your fat is in the wrong place, that maybe it won't efficiently get rid of the fat that's in the wrong place. Or am I wrong in that? I'm just wondering if it sticks around or how does something like exercise help someone in this case? I think you can. I think you can burn the fat well with, with exercise and with diet and things. And those things will really help and they'll lower your ceramides. And there are probably specific diets we could do. Um, I think that all works well. To me, the inflection point is once the cell's dead, right? <laughs> once the cell is gone, then your exercise has less of a chance to be beneficial because you're not burning fat anymore, but you're actually, you know, trying to re re regrow a cell, which is a different, different beast. So I think you can reverse the early phase, the selective insulin resistance, and even the early lipotoxicity that happens. But once you start to get to this terminal damage, which involves cell death, and then later fibrotic tissues, fibrosis happening, that's where I think it becomes unclear whether reversibility is possible. It's a good question. We've made a drug to lower ceramides. So we're trying to ask that question now um, and hoping. That... I have uh, like a hundred questions, but just one of them, like, I guess I'm thinking of now is just kind of, um, does there seem to be kind of a, like a progression, like certain orders, like in which tissues or organs start to be affected by ceramides? <coughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, it's interesting to me, diabetes, you know, manifests in different people very, very differently. Like one of the things we're finding is we found some people that have gene variants that affect their ability to develop, to get rid of ceramides. Um, there are particular ceramidases that get rid of ceramides and they develop really bad kidney disease really fast. So that seems to be a place that's particularly bad but those people are lacking the ceramides, ceramidases in those tissues that are preferentially in those tissues, you know? So I don't know why some people seem to have more of a problem in the heart versus the kidney versus the blood vessel versus the liver. 
and it seems to be bad everywhere in the mouth. So I don't, but it's a great question. I just don't have an answer. Oh, I have one. That, I'm sure. Oh, okay. Go go ahead, Emily. <laughs> okay. I think I'm really quickly. Okay. Um, I was just curious. Um, I think early on in lipotoxicity, you talk about inflammation that happens associated with that. So like pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I'm wondering what the effects of that little like intermediate step and like inflammation has. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. What we have found is that inflammation drives up this pathway. It drives up ceramides selectively. Actually, years ago, it was found out by people that were doing the lipid maps initiative that if they gave an inflammatory agonist, the one pathway that was turned on was the one that made ceramides. Um, there are some data, I guess I can take this off. Um, there are some data that um, ceramides will drive inflammation. We never see that. So to us, it's the other way around. You know, in the, in the clinic, uh, th these things, uh, these folks uh, certainly come in family units. And so w where does uh, epigenetics and intergenerational predisposition uh, a predestination maybe uh, uh, factor into all this. Yeah, our, that's been the next frontier for us is trying to figure out, are there families that have, is there a familial hyperceramidemia, which is analogous to hypercholesterolemia that Brown and Goldstein found? The problem is nobody measured ceramides for years. So we just don't have the genetic variants that we found there's an individual here, Marcus Pezzalesi in nephrology, and we've been working with Marcus, and he has now found three different families that lack these genes that degrade ceramides, and they seem to have really high ceramides, and they're the ones that have kidney disease. But he found them by looking for people that had really bad kidney disease. So, you know, we haven't looked in every other disease indication to find out, but my guess is we're going to see that they track in families and there's a gen, there, are gen, there are a lot of different genetic places where you can change the synthesis or the degradation or the packaging or other things. Um, but we're way, way, way behind the cholesterol folks on that. And a really dumb question. I mean, what samples, uh, collection techniques do you need to to have be able to measure ceramides is that just plain old serum or plasma or yeah we do it in both um and you have to do it in the mass spec so we you know they're pretty stable actually so we can we recently did some studies that were 30 or 40 years old well, the samples were and we measured we you extract all the lipids by using our organic solvent and then you run them through the mass spec and, and which is very sensitive, but there's not a very cheap way to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem for the clinics um, is you have to do that. But the serum does seem to be telling us a lot. And the advantage of serum of course, is you can do hundreds of patients or thousands of patients rather than doing um, this, this test that's in the clinic is done because this company in Finland has done over a hundred thousand patients. Mm -hmm and found that ceramides were better than cholesterol at predicting disease. But I would love to see a ceramide test that you could do at point of care in a clinic, <laughs> right? Okay, well, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. No, that was great. Thank, Thank you. you, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. All right, thanks all.